missing a car key? We're just gonna have it out the front uh, office. Start right out here. So, someone will recognize it eventually. All right, uh, welcome to the last session of this conference. My name is Collier Lunt. I am currently a Utah State University student going into electrical engineering. And I have the wonderful opportunity to introduce John Kim. Uh, John Kim has been a longtime supporter of the Shingo Prize and Partners in Business. He first spoke at the Shingo Conference in 1999 and Partners in Business in 2000, and he's probably spoken here about four times since then. He is a 10-year member of the Shingle Board of Examiners. He's a former executive with the Hong Company and the Donahue Corporation. Over the last 17 plus years, he has worked with companies in multiple sectors using the Shingle model as a platform from which to improve process, performance, and developing staff, leaders, and executives. A brief list of companies with whom John has consulted with has included GE, G, G Healthcare, and a lot of their sub companies. Uh, he's done a lot of stuff with health insurance and uh, with manufacturing companies like Lockheed Martin. He's done a lot of defense contracts with the Air Force, Navy, and Army. John has been married for 30 years, has two sons and two grandchildren. And he is a Cubs fan, so whoever has watched this last game, I'm pretty sure he's pretty excited. He had uh, seats just right above uh, first base, so he can tell you some pretty good stories about that. Uh, please help me welcome John Kim. Thanks, Collier. And uh, thanks to everybody for uh, taking the time. Um, I want to applaud everybody for just the notion of continual learning and challenging yourself to... Uh, uh, think in different ways, right? Think, think bigger and broader. You know, one of the challenges that we all have, everybody, is we only know what we know. The scary part is we don't know what we don't know, right? And so how do we, you know, continually challenge ourselves in a way to, be, to continually self-reflect, right, on the things that are working well and things that uh, maybe we weren't uh, um, uh, as informed about, right, that, that come to be. Um, there's something else I kind of just want to talk about um, as before I get started on some of the slides. Um, I was pretty fortunate as a youngster to have been given some opportunities um, very young uh, to become a plant manager, GM, and VP of Ops at a couple of different companies. And one of the first things that was told to me um, <coughs> by a gentleman, Tom Emang, uh, one of my first mentors who was down in Orem, Utah, was he said, John, you have to, you have to understand the responsibility that comes with um, A, being talented, uh, being able to figure stuff out, and then being given opportunity. So I'm talking to all you guys and gals. And that responsibility is you're not supervising or managing 15 people, eight people, or 380 people in a plant, right? When you become a leader, um, accept the personal responsibility that you're actually taking care of 380 families. And the decisions that you make and you as the leader and the way that you lead, the way that you engage, right, um, affects 380 families, right? So just think about that from a little bit of, uh, a little bit of perspective. Um, another piece that kind of goes with that same story, right, I think it was the back end of that meeting with Tommy Mang was, John, something else you have to remember is <laughs> three to 5% improvement is called doing your job. In other words, you know, don't be doing high fives, right, at three to 5% improvement. Right. As a leader, as a manager, as a supervisor, three to five percent improvement is the expectation for sitting in the seats to drive that particular that particular bus. Right. So real breakthrough thinking, real improvement, right, comes with challenges that start with can we get ten percent, twenty percent, thirty percent? Right. So just think about that for a little for, for, for a little bit here, right? Three to five percent improvement is what's expected to do your job. You as a leader, continuous improvement leader, process improvement leader, plant manager, general manager, whatever that role happens to be, right? The thought process should start, right, with breakthrough improvements, something that sounds like 10%. All right. Um, <coughs> as we get started here, uh, a couple, just so you guys know, if you haven't heard already, I'm kind of notorious for 
using too many slides with too many words and going over time. So I understand I'm the last thing between you guys and ice cream, all right? So I'll do my best to uh, uh, not mess that up, all righty? Here's a couple of topics we're gonna cover, all right? And I'll try and go through each one of those. Obviously the theme of, of the keynote today, right, is the notion of um, how to build systems that drive ideal behavior or that guide ideal behavior, right? And so you're gonna hear a couple of themes as uh, we talk about a few things. Um, <coughs> starting a little bit of a review of shingle prize kind of stuff. You've seen a few of these come up already, right? Just to emphasize a few things, right? Obviously there's the guiding principles, right? Within the shingle model itself, right? These are oh so true and oh so solid and they cross every industry, right? Whether it be healthcare, uh, defense, health insurance, banking, uh, oil and gas, all of the sectors, right? These guiding principles hold true. You guys have seen the diamond, right? And again, focusing on the notion of culture is what keeps everything together inside the diamond. And then this notion right here, right? Enabling, right? Your teams, enabling your organization to be successful, right? We're gonna talk, we're gonna, I'm gonna go into more detail on this as we go forward. But the notion of talking about behavior, systems and tools, right? And we're talking about each of those three different pieces. Uh, tomorrow there's a workshop from eight to noon where we talk, um, spend four hours talking about implementing the shingle model. I don't know the rules on signing up or not signing up, but talk to Dakota and Eden, right? <coughs> All right, shingle model, right? So um, everybody seen this diamond? Right, raise your hand, right? Uh, everybody comfortable with the notion of, hey, right? It's all, we have to, we have to focus on the results, right? That's, that's, that's why we're here, right? And then there's different components, right, of the diamond itself, which I'm gonna use the older slide just to talk about a little bit. Um, <coughs> there's two different approaches. Right, and you probably, many of you in this room, I'm sure have heard some of it before. If we start with the understanding that we have, our, part of our responsibility is to improve performance, right? Deliver results, right? The results could be revenue, the results could be quality, the results could be on-time delivery, faster turnaround time, better patient satisfaction, whatever it may be. If our, respons if our responsibility is to deliver results, something that 999 out of 1,000 companies do, right? And it's not necessarily wrong, right? Is they achieve results by applying tools, right? We call that tool-based architecture, right? I'm not gonna go a lot of detail on that. I'm gonna spend more time talking about a principle-based architecture. One of the challenges you have if you, if you take a tools-based approach is that you can accomplish results or you can improve performance in a lot of different ways, right? Things that maybe are wholesome and noble and things that may not be so wholesome and noble. I could achieve, I could drive my plans to improve productivity by telling my people to run instead of walk, right? And putting different things in place, right? To encourage them, right? To work faster, work harder. But that's not the principles from which um, I believe is the right way to lead an organization, right? I'll have the shingle model. Right, so when we talk about a, um, a principle-based architecture, a la the shingle model, we talk about we wanna achieve results, but we wanna do it using the right principles, right? Understanding how we want to achieve the results, right? It's not just about achieving the results, it's how do we wanna achieve the results? And in understanding how we want to achieve the results, we can then ask ourselves the question, what kind of processes, or what kind of systems do we need to put in place to guide our teams to achieve the results in the way that we had intended, right? And with the ethics and integrity, right, that we had intended. If you take a principle-based architecture, principle-based approach, you will focus on the results. You'll make sure to have a conversation around who are we and who are we not. From this conversation, you'll talk about what kind of systems do we need to put in place to guide our employees to do the right thing, to help them be successful, and when we know what kind of systems we need, we'll actually pull the tools that we need to create the systems. Does that make sense? Right, so instead of jumping right, right from results and putting in production control boards to monitor hour by hour performance and say, how are you doing? Right, let's stand back, right, and understand, right, what are the right systems we need first. We'll go into more, more detail as well. Um, another thought process here, right, kind of teeing you guys up as we get into some of the content, is we talk a lot around align, enable, and improve, 
all right? And you're going to hear a big dose of a line or focus um, in, in everything I talk about. Um, <clears throat> let me ask this, this, this group question. Um, is every waste that your teams find, is every waste that they find worth the time and the effort to eliminate and solve? Don't answer yet. Let me change the sentence just a little bit. If your improvement resources were infinite and free, is every waste you find worth the time and the effort to solve? The answer is yes. All right, but what's the reality about any organization's improvement resources? They're extremely finite. So how we choose to expend those very finite resources will go hand in hand for how effective your improvement activities are to accomplishing the objective. Does that make sense? You guys okay with that? All right, it's, it might sound obvious. It ain't obvious when you get in the industry. All right, that's why you hear so much about focus and alignment. Okay, so anyway, right, we talk about alignment. What is it we want to achieve? All right, and then we talk about enabling employees, giving them the capabilities, the resources, the tools, right, to, be, to, be, to make the improvement. Align, enable, improve. There's a catch to this. <coughs> that only work, that's only the right approach when you have the right core processes in place. If you have the right core processes in place, you will do align, enable, improve in that order. If you don't have the right core processes in place, all right, we actually want to go align, improve the processes before we, before we enable people. All right, quick example. Uh, has anybody here worked in an assembly area in a factory? There's a few of you, all right? This will work for everybody here. If we looked in the assembly area and the people that worked in that area, they never had all the parts, what's the first thing that we would do to improve that area? Get them all the parts, right? We might do it by kitting. We might do it by putting in Kanban. We might do it by different kinds of other solutions or systems, but we wouldn't tell our people, you need to go improve until we first gave them the core processes that allowed them to be successful. All right, so if you don't have those core processes in place, right, make sure to take the time to put those in place to give them the foundation to be successful. We do roughly 70% of our work in my company with hospitals. <coughs> we have done enough work with hospitals over 12, 13 years that we know pretty much every service line in the hospital, uh, the, the OR, the emergency room, the, inpa the ICUs, and so on and so on. There's not a single service line in a hospital that has more than six core processes you gotta get right. Most only have three or four, all right? So just keep that in mind, right? We use the phrase a lot, you never have to fix the entire process to make a big impact on, or meaningful impact on the, on the objective that you're going after, if you're targeted, all right? So align, enable, improve, and <coughs> well, I'm gonna come back to that in a second, all right? Same question right there. Again, uh, probably 85% of the slides I'm showing I'll make available to Dakota, so they'll be available for you guys to pull online as well. When we align, the, when, we, when we link this up with some of the uh, Shingo principles, right? Oops. <coughs> Again, right? Align to the strategic few, right? One of the one of the phrases we use as well is um, whenever we work with any department manager, plant manager, company executive, right? The first thing we ask is if you can improve any two metrics by double digits in 12 months, what might you pick? Does it sound like revenue, growth, quality, cost, speed the market of new technologies? All right, we say double digits, right, because we want to create a stretch goal, All right? It's that conversation, right, that allows us to start talking about, right, the strategic few. Remember, we think three to 5% improvement, right, is what everybody should be doing anyway, right, who's working in operations. All right. As we, <coughs> oh, <coughs> if we talk, if we don't, if we think about, if we're missing any one of alignment, enabling the people, or improving, what happens? What happens if we don't start with alignment and we enable people and give them improvement systems? What, what might we get? Yeah, a lot of stuff, a lot of good stuff, right? A lot of waste identified, a lot of problems solved, Right, a lot of uh, uh, improvement made, a lot of reduction in walking distance, moving fax machines, whatever it might be. But if we're missing alignment, right, there's a very, very big risk that we're gonna do a lot of things in the organization that are not so connected, 
right, to the objective itself, right? You guys okay with that? It's probably, if you walk with any one thing out of this session, it's actually the single most important thing, right? So you always start, right, with what is it that we're, that, that, that we're trying to accomplish. If we align, but we don't enable the people, what do we get? Six seven black belts doing a lot of projects, right, to the shop floor and to the office. Right? If we align and we enable people, if we don't give them a mechanism or the capability or the training to improve, what do we get? Right? A lot of frustrated folks. Right? So think about it right, as some form of a three-legged stool. Maybe they're not all the same length, right? but all, all three components apply. There's another concept to keep in mind, too, and it has to do with uh, the development of your organization. Um, in the old days, old days 98 to 2002, running a consulting company, the majority of the clients that we had, say 70, 80%, were companies that were struggling financially in the, on the business side. That's why they came to find a consultant, right? Well, what's interesting is nowadays, in the last 10 years, 80% of our clients I would classify as industry leaders of some sort. So it's kind of the opposite, right? A lot of people would say, oh, he must like working with companies that are struggling because there's so much upside to be gained. There's so much low-hanging fruit. Not really. Organizations that are struggling for in performance are not usually struggling by accident. They're missing a lot of gaps. We don't have the right leaders in place. We don't have the right leadership structure in place. They don't have the right tools in place. Culture is tough. The engineers don't communicate well with the shop. There's a lot of stuff, right, that you have to fix in order to actually take advantage of a better process or a better system. What's interesting is high-performing organizations are not high-performing by accident. They can do a lot of stuff. They can communicate, they can make a decision, they can implement things, they can deploy things. They have standard work. When they change something, people really do it, right? When we put a measure in place to temporarily measure how the process is now performing, they actually do it. They know how to use the information. So the truth of the matter is, the velocity at which you can actually make improvement, right, goes hand in hand, right, with the culture and the capabilities and the existing capability of the, of the organization you're working with. One thing that I always want to be cautious of when I speak at conferences is um, as speakers, we can speak to one, typically one, two, one of two different dimensions. We can speak to um, uh, the assumption that you guys and gals are going to be working in a OC Tanner, auto leave, lifetime products kind of company. We can also speak to the notion that you're not going to be working at one of those kind of companies, right? I'm actually going to talk more towards what you're more likely going to run into, and that is companies who are not so OC Tanner-ish, not so auto leave-ish, right? So just keep that in mind as you're uh, filtering my information. <coughs> All right, so again, there's a cycle that goes through. There's a lot of peeling the onion kind of conversations in this lean stuff, right? But just keep in mind, right, these, these three pieces, right? And how fast you can go is, is, is uh, tied to the capabilities in the organization. So understanding systems. Oh. My uh, animation didn't work. Let's see if I can get this right. Okay, so how many people here, when, you think, when I use the word system, think IT, raise your hand. Okay. You're with 97% of the planet. <laughs> In Shingo world, right, we use the word systems, right, to, to refer to things like work systems, right? Most people call those processes. Right, the processes that we need in order to uh, um, assemble an iPhone or to uh, build a gearbox, right? So there's work systems. Let me see if this works here. In addition to work systems, right, if you're working in the cell, there are support systems, right? Engineers, tooling, materials, hmm, right? Uh, 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 PM, maintenance. In addition to support systems, there's management systems. John, the frontline manager, what kind of systems do I have to use that allow me to effectively monitor and manage performance and in turn, right, guide or encourage or enable the right kind of improvement, right? And we also have things fundamentally around improvement systems. There's more systems than this if you want to. You can call communication systems if you want. This here is just trying to create the framework of the notion that, hey, remember, there's a value-added piece, which is the work systems themselves, right? Those are the guys and gals working in the cell or in manufacturing, or that's the guys and gals working in customer service, right, if they're in the office. Supporting those individuals doing the real work are those in the, some sort of support role 
some sort of management systems to be able to monitor and manage and some sort of improve, improvement structure. Think about systems in that particular way. All right, because as we start talking about making improvements or designing systems to guide the right behavior or to guide ideal behavior, we're going to start with what's the objective. Who here is uh, familiar with the term value stream mapping? Raise your hand. Okay, so 80% of you, that's good. Um, I'm going to give a quick example with regard to why business case or why alignment at the front end is so, so important. Um, one of the things that we say is that when I train consultants or when, I tra when we train clients, we never build a beautiful map. Okay, let me explain what that means. We always start with what is the business case, right? If it's, if it's your department or your plant and you can improve any two measures by double digits in 12 months, what might you pick? If you pick productivity as an example, and we look at the value stream from raw material to get paid by customer, right, or order receipt to get paid by customer, and the business case is productivity. If you think about that map, not all parts of that process equally impact productivity. You with me so far? The area that we're going to focus on is where their population density is, direct labor. And there's other parts of the process that don't impact productivity so much. So when we map it, it ain't going to be so important. Is that okay so far? Let me change the business case. What if the business case wasn't productivity? The business case was inventory or was quality. There's now, the odds are, almost guaranteed, the areas of that value stream that impact quality the mostest aren't necessarily the exact same areas that impacted productivity the mostest. So when you map with a business case in mind, you wind up with a different map. You guys okay with that? If you don't map with a business case, you're going to map everything, right? And you're not going to be able to select and deselect the areas that have tight alignment to the objective and the areas that don't, all right? You're going to hear this theme over and over again. All right, let's take an example. Cashier, right? We all know, we all have bought things at the grocery store, right? We're in what, Albertsons and Kroger land, is that right? Is there, what are the grocery stores here? I should have done my homework. That's okay. All right. What kind of results do we want to see with the cashier? Right? What does a good process, what, a good, what does a good result sound like with the cashier? Help me out. Fast. What else? Friendly. Friendly. All right. Accurate. Accurate. Good. Right? Good kind of objectives. Right? So, hey, if we start with those being the objectives, right, then we ask ourselves the question, oh, well, what kinds of behavior do we want to see to achieve those objectives? Right? One, one, there's, there's, there's certain behaviors to achieve the objective of friendly and nice and supportive and knowledgeable and that kind of thing. All right? So we then say, um, what is, oh, then what is the primary work system for the cashier? What's the actual work of the cashier themselves? It's probably the, uh, the belt, their cash register, their scanner, their bagger. That's actually their work system. Okay? Everything else is in support of them. We expect the support systems to work supporting that cashier. You ever had something they try and scan and it's not in the system? That's a failure of a support system, right? You have, have you ever seen an employee and they perhaps weren't trained on how to handle a coupon? Or they weren't trained on how to handle a grocery item that's not a barcode, that's actually a weigh-in item, right? Those are failures in my mind, in our mind, of support systems, right? So, so in order for that individual to be successful, Right? Let's begin to understand what are we trying to accomplish, right? And what are the various systems that are in place? Then we also talk about tools, right? And tools can improve certain dimensions as well, right? Bar scanner is faster than typing it in, right? With the uh, uh, with uh, typing in the price in every single one, right? And then, <coughs> what kind of support systems, right? Do you think also exist, right? Hopefully, there's a training process. Right, uh, you know, hopefully there's a uh, call, um, if in doubt, call for the manager, the manager will show up, right? Hopefully there's some sort of onboarding process to get them up to speed, right? We'd expect all of those different systems to exist, right, to enable that particular individual to be successful, right? Is that okay, just in terms of an example? All right, um, <coughs> oops, and then what kind of management systems do you think exist? All right, for the store manager, right, you can probably track, you know, sales per hour, sales per minute, am I as fast or as productive as you thought, 
right? Um, and do I have a lot of returns? Uh, do I have a lot of errors? I don't know, right? I'm sure there's an entire dashboard of some sort, right, that allows the managers to be able to evaluate performance. Right? And again, those are all different systems in place, right, to uh, um, <coughs> uh, manage something like a cashier. Here's an interesting picture, right? This happens to be Park, uh, Parker Hannafin cell where the cell is actually a value stream. All right, these, air tra these uh, flight controllers come in, they get torn down and put back together at the exact same time. All right, so this, this actually station is actually entire value stream, right, uh, up to shipping. And they have different systems supporting this guy. There's point of use tooling, that's a support system. There's floor stock, that's the support system for materials. There's kitted materials, that's just another support system. All right? There's standard work that's been written, so he or she knows what to do. There's an 80% kit. Right? In other words, not everything is used every single time, but if they need one, he has access to it. There's something over here called the Kanban Cylinder Assembly. So around this particular individual are, all, are a series of different support systems, all targeted at the business case of turnaround time, productivity, and quality. <coughs> I'm going to give you a, a quick description of what this bench looked like eight months before this. The cylinder, the, uh, the actuator would come in, it would get torn apart. The parts that were bad were thrown away. The parts that were good were bagged and tagged. Sent to the warehouse to be put away, where they were entered with MRP to go ahead and launch work orders. Right? Now it's in La La Land. Eventually when all the parts get done, right, some planner gets a, notion, gets a notice to say the, the, the parts are ready to go. They then pull all the kits, they send it back to the guy, this is six weeks later now, Right? And then he or she will then try and rebuild that particular actuator. They spent more time bagging and tagging because of FAA regulations than it took to actually build the actuator. Right? Does that, that before and after seem to make sense? Right? This turnaround time was literally six hours. Right? Compared to what it was before was between 30 and 47 days depending on the unit itself. Right? Because we identified the objective, turnaround time, that was the pathway to growth. Productivity was the pathway to margin. Right? And quality, we could not screw up. Right? And then from that, that pathway, we, st we stood back and said, what systems are the ones that are most appropriate to impact our measure? All right, building systems. <coughs> Where to begin? <coughs> Identify the right systems. All right? Identify the right processes. You never have to fix the whole thing to make a big impact on the metric that you're going after. All right? So members start with what we call a business case. Right? We almost always right, define the objective we want to focus on or target or achieve. What are we after? Be careful at asking for five things because when you ask for more than two things, most people can't focus on three. And that's not a, a knock on anybody. It's just too many dimensions of, of improvement to try and uh, tackle at one time. <coughs> Once we know what we're trying to do, we can then say which systems are needed to be successful. Translated, what's your business case? Depending on what you want, we're going to ask the question, which processes or which systems impact that metric the mostest? It ain't all of them. Once we know the systems that we need to impact that metric, we then can target and focus a la rifle shot versus shotgun. We can be very targeted in terms of how we expend our resources to improve certain support systems or certain processes to give us the objective that we want. I can tell you that <coughs> A, not many people are that crazy about it like I am, <laughs> or my team is. Um, I forgot to say this at the beginning, having been a former plant manager and GM in the past, by definition, I kind of hate consultants, right? And now I kind of am one, <laughs> right? And so we built our entire business model on the notion of compelling value. And if we cannot demonstrate compelling value to whoever the clients may be, we don't deserve to be at the table, right? There's another phrase, right? For financial measures, if the, con if the controller can't measure it, it don't count. Going back to what Jerry was talking about early today, right? If you can't identify and target things that can be, if you're after financial improvement, which 80% are, if you, can't, if you can't actually identify and measure what you're trying to improve financially, is it cost, is it revenue, is it cash, is it inventory? Right? And if you can't make that number move the way the controller measures it, right, you actually have no real improvement. Right? And by the way, that forces a lot of upfront conversation, just as Jerry was talking about with, with finance. 
with those systems, we then say, which are the behaviors that represent how you want your people to achieve the goal? We don't want people to achieve inventory reduction, right, by telling trucks not to show up on the 30th of the month because we take it because the financials close on the 30th and they all show up on the first of the month. Right? That, that's, do you guys follow how that works? Right? The, the, the month then closes whenever it is. A, a game that a lot of people play is uh, just schedule all, don't schedule any receipts inside the last week other than what I need to ship a product that week. So then the, on the first Monday after the end of the month, all the trucks are in the parking lot, and so now you're just faking it and you're just gaming it. Right? <coughs> um, some of you are kind of squ you know, squinting your eyes saying, do they really do that? Yeah, they really do that. <laughs> Think about the behavior that we want to accomplish. Um, I had a, a great lead person, his name was Scott Fix, right? And um, when I was running a plant uh, in the early 90s, and Scott came up to me one time and said, hey, John, did you notice? We got three weeks in a row of complete non-time. Yeah, and Scott was on second shift, right? <laughs> nice job, Scott. He said, hey, <clears throat> don't worry, I got your back. What do you mean? He said, um, we had a unit with a barcode, and I scanned it, right, even though they were shipping it in the morning. So, hey, Scott, <laughs> Let's, he was a good guy. He thought he was doing the right thing. I had just taken over running the operation where the way I wanted my team to achieve the result was different than the guy before me, right? So that was an interesting conversation to have. He goes, well, you want us to count that one as late? Hey, if we don't have it, we don't have it, right? If, we, if the customer's not going to get it, right, we can't claim it, right? And that's the beginnings, right? Uh, you've heard a lot about leadership here today this morning as well. Those little things matter, right? <clears throat> Again, talking to everyone in this room as future leaders, future plant managers, here's another little thing that matters. And you'll see any, every lean leader does the exact same thing. If you're walking through your plant and you see a piece of garbage on the side, on, in, the, in the walkway, you pick it up, all right? Because you need to live by the same example you expect your own folks to live by, all right? Little things matter, all right? Again, what's the behavior that we want to, uh, uh, that, that, we, that we want people to exhibit whilst accomplishing the objectives that we're asking them to accomplish. All right. And again, <coughs> uh, there's another piece, by the way, about this thing called 10%. What happens if I say, pick a goal that's 4% higher, and in your mind, you think you can get 4% with what you already know? What's going to happen? You're not going to be as open to thinking about some of the crazy ideas, right, that come out with this lean stuff. 10% is usually a threshold where people say, criminy, if I knew how to get 10, you wouldn't be here. All right? I can get three or four. Tell me how to get 10. I'm more open. All right? And by the way, 10 is, is a very achievable number. There's very, very, very few uh, client games we have where the, uh, the, the level one threshold for improvement is not a double-digit number. All right, um, so we'll talk about each one of these one at a time. Define the objective that you want to focus on, right? Why is it important, right? What happens if we don't, if we don't pick a uh, measure to focus on? That's right. It sounds like a silly question right now, doesn't it? Right? It, but I'm telling you, if, you're not, if you haven't been trained to start with this particular, with, with the focus and clarity of this particular question, um, this is not as evident. But now that we've talked about it, right, and those will be at the workshop, we'll practice, practice some of it tomorrow, uh, I don't think it'll go any other way, right? And how might taking this approach help your department organization? Help me out. If you start with an objective, how might it help your team uh, versus if you didn't have uh, an objective to start with? Pick it on you. You'll be able to target your resources better. Right? And again, by knowing what it is that we're going after, right? let's, let's, let's tie this back to employee engagement right? and suggestions. Right? So being kind of in this lean space, right? I suspect we're all pretty aware of the language of employee engagement, ideas, suggestion boards, right? let's implement solutions. All that's true. Right? If we can put alignment at the front end of that, what we're basically saying to the group is I want your ideas, but let's all stay focused on quality or let's all stay focused on on-time delivery right of our super complicated units what you're doing is you're still engaging your staff still engaging your team but you're engaging them in a framework right so that it's not every idea is a good idea right you have the first filter in place right and you're actually at the same time you're teaching your team 
right? How to select and deselect in their own mind as part of the natural cycle. Um, I'm not sure we was talking about it earlier today. Um, there are some exceptions to this. I have had areas uh, with clients and my own plants that <coughs> were tough. They haven't bought into this for years and they ain't about to buy into it, all right? In those areas, I'll take almost anything, right? As, a, as an initial starting point for the beginnings of Engate. If, if someone's willing to step on a limb, right? Stepping out away from six of their buddies to say, I have an idea and maybe it's not so aligned I'll trade alignment for the first crack of engagement, all right? So keep that back, keep in the back of your mind, right? Um, uh, you're certainly going to cross that at some point, all right? And then depending on your, on your objective, right? Obviously, your improvement plan is, is totally going to change. Um, <clears throat> so how might your approach change if your goal was to reduce lead time versus improve productivity, all right? We gave a little bit of an example, all right? And, <clears throat> oh, your target processes might change. Right? When we're talking about lead time, maybe this is about supply chain. Right? And we're running lot for lot MRP. So we got full exposure to our supply chain. And if lead time is the issue, maybe the strategy or the area we have to either talk about uh, sourcing, talk about supply chain, perhaps put in a Kanban. Right? Hmm. Right? Toyota does things like they'll have some suppliers actually store their stuff in a warehouse within two hours of the plant itself, depending on the situation. Right? So target processes could change, right? Key behaviors. Hmm. If we're talking about lead time more than productivity, and if the lead time focus is in supply chain, the behavior we're targeting is materials. All right? Materials and sourcing and planning. If the lead time, right, is all driven by the shop, we're launching 30-day work orders. Right? Then our area of focus might be a little bit different. All right. One of the key things I'm trying to emphasize is as long as you allow yourself to ask the question of the objective and begin to ask the question about what are the drivers, right? you're actually holding back shooting any of your bullets until you're getting more information, more information, more information. And then when you're close enough, you got a nice short shot. Right? Again, as opposed to, right, let's, do, let's do 5S across the whole plant. Right? What kind of tools might we use? Tools might be totally different, right, depending on the objective we're going after, right? What kind of skills are needed by the staff or skills needed by the leaders? This is a huge one. You will run into this. The skills that were needed to be successful in a non-lean type environment, office or shop, are not likely going to be the same set of skills that are going to be needed to be successful in a lean shop, all right? You're going to have to figure out, right? You're going to have to have, as part of your plan, an understanding Right, as to whether or not, um, <clears throat> is it DNA, is it knowledge, understanding, or capability? If it's knowledge or understanding, you might be able to close that gap. Don't ask me to run. Don't ask me to dunk a basketball. I ain't going to get there, right, no matter how hard I try. You can yell at me more, and it still ain't going to work, right? Let me do another type of example, right? <laughs> And we've all seen this. You ever walked into a, a company and the person who's working the front desk just isn't very nice? What I say is, how'd they give him that job? Right? So think about, right, what kind of skills or capabilities do you think you're going to need, right, to be successful in the new environment? We owe it to the people that work in the area and the people who run those areas. We owe it to them to have that conversation and let them know the types of things we think we need and where they might stand with respect to closing the gap and help them close the gap, all right? Uh, commitments made to senior leaders. Ooh, this is the big one, particularly if you ain't the senior leader, all right? If you don't get clarity on focus, on objective, on, how, on what they want, how much they want, how fast they want it, if you don't get that clarity, you're at risk of saying, you bet your boss I can do it in six months or two months but you don't really know the answer, all right? Going through this process will help you um, flush that out. What kind of resources are needed, okay? I've never done this kind of Kanban before. I've only known Kanban in automotive, where a dedicated cell, tack time of 210 seconds, right? Dedicated water spiders, dedicated operators, right? I'm now working in a place where we make capital equipment, right? We never make the same thing twice, oh my gosh. 
all right? What kind of resources might I need to help me and my team be successful, okay? And then time, all right? Uh, and then again, same question here. What might happen to your approach, right, if you had no objective? All right, that's the most dangerous situation of all, right? Okay, um, example. Um, <coughs> What, so next question, what kind of systems are critical to enabling our employees to be successful? So the first one is, right, pick something that's important, right? Again, have your business case. Next one is identify the systems that are needed for success. All right, this here happens to be an emergency department, right? Um, I can tell you the processes that have to be in place the, in order for an ED to work, ER to work really, really well. One is there has to be a fast track process, right? In other words, uh, we like to ask the question when we're working in a hospital with an emergency department, in your current process today, can your fast go fast or do your fast wait behind the slow? Okay, you want a process that allows the fast to go fast, right? Why? Appropriate care, fast turnaround time, good patient satisfaction, high productivity, high quality, appropriate quality of care, and they're not tying up rooms, right? <coughs> um, another key process is lab turnaround time. Almost everyone that goes to the AD gets a lab. If you don't have a process that gives you a good turnaround time on the lab, Right, your, your, your wait time inside your exam rooms is gonna be long. Next one, imaging, CT and MRI, right? 20% of all patients in ED are gonna CT or MRI. If they're built on a two hour turnaround time or whenever they have time, your eight cylinder engine is working on six cylinders because you've got two patients waiting for the long turnaround time. Right, and then you have to have a main process as well for your main, main ED and the other one is decision to admit to admit. We decided to admit the patient how soon can we build that process to get that patient up to the fifth floor where they're supposed to go? Every hospital struggles with this because they don't want to take them up here. All right, so this wait time can literally be three, four hours. Now your eight cylinder engine is not working on six cylinders, they're working on four cylinders and patients are still coming in. So we know that if you get those core processes right, right, then the whole thing opens up, right? That's the first layer of the onion to drive a lot of metrics in the ED. Um, <clears throat> Not all processes or not all systems are created equal. Not all wastes are created equal. Kind of what I talked about earlier as well. Again, if you have the focus up front, these become obvious. If you don't have a focus up front, that's a great idea, Jimmy. Go for it. Right? <clears throat> and then where should we focus our efforts? Is it about material? Is it about information? Right? Is it about standard work? Just real quick, there's a lot of dialogue going on about TWI in the lean community right now. Right? And uh, TWI is very, very appropriate for, for a certain level or for a certain space of improvement or standard work. Typically, the task level, operator level, level is where TWI plays. Who here is not familiar with TWI? Raise your hand. Okay, quick story. Uh, World War II, right, America goes to war, right? Remember that before World War II, women were not in the workplace. If you're running a plant and the America went to war, what's the first thing you lost? All of your workforce. So they all left, right? They went to, went to the war. Well, that's also the era where women entered the workforce, right? Rosie the Riveter, right? And now there is a challenge. Well, golly, how do we get all of our, our labor back up to speed? The example that I've read, I think is a great example, is lens grinder for a bomb site. How long does it take to become a certified lens grinder? Eight years. That won't work. War's over in four. All right, huh. How can we crack this nut? Well, how long would it take? to get someone to be able to do 80% of what a lens grinder does. Because we do have a lot of senior guys and gal guys that are still left here. Well, we might be able to build that one faster. That's the foundation of TBI, right? The, the, let's take 100% of the right 80%, 100% of the right 70%. And let's, let's master the ability to get people up to speed very, very quickly. And it worked, right? It was ridiculous, right? We, we lost 110 bombers a day and didn't, didn't skip a beat, right? So now, Right, that worked, we won the war, blah, 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 blah. Soldiers came back, guess what happened? Get it out of here, right? TV is gone. MacArthur is, is now gets the assignment to re-industrialize Japan with pretty much a flat slate, right? He, he thought back to TBY as the mobilization vehicle to get the speed in the US, brought it to Japan. It became the foundation of standard work at Toyota. That's the story behind TBY. Right, so TBY, it, it has many different applications, but the place where it works really, really well is creating repetition and standard work and training, typically, right, of a task or of a process, right? Not um, of a task, not necessarily of a process crossing multiple people, per se. 
Um, and then I want to make sure to touch some other things as well. Onboarding process could be, could be critical, right? Anybody who's worked fast food, who's been a manager at a Burger King or a McDonald's, onboarding is key, right? <laughs> uh, product development. Uh, <laughs> I think it was Jerry said that earlier. Product development is where you make new revenue, you make new margin, and you create space between you and your competition, right? And he's absolutely right in saying that it typically gets done in year five or six. It should be done in year one, right? And then at what point do we engage employees, right, with daily Kaizen and A3? A um, little bit of a case study, right? Um, <clears throat> by the way, we have something like 20 of these types of case studies on our website. Just feel free to go there and you can download them on PDFs, right? Um, this here is a recent one. Uh, the Caterpillar's largest manufacturer of exhaust systems. Their business case was lead time, quality, and cost, right? They had to get lead time down from 30 days, right? <laughs> Um, quality was not where they wanted it to be, and uh, cost, cost pressures were coming in uh, all over the place. We went with a model plant approach, right? There's six plants in the company, took a model plant. Sometimes we take a model line inside a plant. Any way you slice it, we're creating a model first. Demonstrate the process of improvement, demonstrate what good looks like, and demonstrate 30 to 40% improvement in real results. If you can't do that in your model, you don't have the right to spread it across, right, the organization, right? <clears throat> that's what we went after, right? Just, you know, we went from a Mac to a PC, so the format is a little bit off. <clears throat> it's the PC's fault. <laughs> um, some of the key systems that were appropriate with this type of objective, we put key flow cells in fabrication from the saws up through the benders. We keep, put key flow cells in MIG welding from the welding all the way through pack. That's how we created velocity. We put in new kitting process for parts and new kitting process for tooling so the guys and gals weren't waiting for parts and tools, right? We, we had to reconfigure the entire ERP system, right? They were using minimum lot sizes, minimum order quantities, order multiples, right? They were using all kinds of parameters in the wrong way, which just drove lot sizes up, right? We had to, we had to, we had to reconfigure the ERP. And then we chose to use Kanban for 100% of the right 60% of products. Right? A bunch of their stuff was buy to order, make to order. But the stuff that didn't have to be buy to order, make to order, we chose to put Kanban in place. Right? What were the results? Right? These are real numbers. Right? <laughs> On time delivery, 84% to 96. Caterpillars tickle to death with 96, believe it or not. <clears throat> Work and process inventory, $2.7 million. Where does $2.7 million come from, come from? It comes from having a shop throughput of 32 days beforehand to having a shop throughput of three days for 70% of the stuff in five days for 95% of the stuff. You follow that? Right? By being able to get it through the shop faster, we don't have work and process inventory. There's still 5% that are just oddballs, right? And they take longer to get through. But we targeted the ones that could go fast, we, we designed them to, to uh, get um, to flow fast. Productivity, 52%, right? Actually, it's 52% on the fabrication side, 42% on the welding side. Either way, right? It was good money. And then operating income, 18%. Here's a crazy number. They got rid of 25 fork trucks. They didn't even know they had 44 fork trucks. Anybody know what a fork truck costs per month to rent? 900 bucks. Do that math. <laughs> it's a quarter million dollars, right, in expense. Because without the whip, you don't need the space. Without the whip, you don't need the fork trucks. Without the whip, you don't need the racks. Blah, 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 right? Direct and indirect savings, right? Um, and then just, just talk about the behaviors you want your people to exhibit as they achieve their goal. What kind of behaviors? Do you want to be not, I made these up, right? Not really. Knowledgeable, capable, competent, informed, responsible, result focused, engaged, right? Those are the types of behaviors that we want to be able to see. There's a whole other category about uh, uh, behaviors. In manufacturing, what does knowledgeable mean? Huh, we want to make sure we have training programs in place. Or I shouldn't say all of these are not necessarily the case. Under knowledgeable, Right? We might have training programs to increase their knowledge. Better onboarding, perhaps, to increase their knowledge. Better standard of work, perhaps, to increase their knowledge. Better employee engagement. Better use of TWI, perhaps job rotation. These are all different systems or types of systems that one might consider right, to raise the knowledge level of the people who work in that particular area. Right? I don't want them working off of uh, post-it notes and going and ask James every single time, what should I do with this one? Right? I want to be capable. What does capable mean? Oh, standard work as well. TWI as well. Poker yoke. 
all right? Fixtures being available, TPM in place, MDI in place, quality at the source. Those are all types of systems that we might choose to put in place to accomplish the objective of making my team more capable. We okay? All right. Um, engaged. How do, you, how do you improve employee engagement? Well, you know what? Let's run the right kind of huddles. Let's have communications board. Let's use a dashboard. Let's have Gemba walks. Let's use our hour-by-hour boards the right way. Let's encourage daily Kaizen. All right? All real stuff. All right? <laughs> and then um, we also want to develop problem solvers. Right? Oh, well, what kinds of systems might we want to put in place? All right? And then again, here's that presumption. Right? All of the above, I would only do once I knew that the core processes for success were in place. If I knew I needed Kanban in order to be successful and Kanban didn't exist, I would not start on employee training until I put that critical system in place. Um, <clears throat> these are different types of systems. I'm going to flip through these just really quick. You can read them later. All right. Uh, tools versus systems, right? Some just starting to give you some pictures now, some examples, right? I avoided getting into how to actually do it. That would take too much time. All right, this is an example of a dashboard, right? Some form of communications of information that means something to the people re who you want to read the board. That's actually an important concept. Um, when I was running uh, um, or at Han, I was measured as plant manager on something called productivity. And productivity was measured on revenue per man hour, a very appropriate measure for George Koenigsacker to evaluate John Kim and all the other plant managers on productivity. But when I took that metric and I gave it and I pushed it down to my floor, guess what my guys said? Don't know what that means. I guess that's one of those things, John, that you do. Right? The translation didn't work. Right? That was talked about earlier today as well. So we knew that we actually had to translate to a language that meant something to the guys and gals on my floor. Minutes per unit, hours per piece, pieces per hour. Right, uh, <clears throat> desks per hour on the desk line. So what came to me as a metric of productivity, revenue per man hour to run the business, as we deployed that into different parts of the business, we translated to a language that made sense to them. Right, and that's how we got the metrics to mean something to the folks that actually did the work. Um, communications are a big deal. This here is what we call a clinical huddle, where a doctor and a nurse may be talking about what's going on. We may use visual management. We may use A3s, right? Key point sheets, right? Uh, Gemba walks are a big part of most lean stuff, right? Um, <clears throat> don't let an executive or any executive do a Gemba walk before they've been trained on what they're supposed to do on a Gemba walk. <laughs> you know, what they want to leave behind is, oh, this went great, right? And behind is just total chaos, right? As they ask the wrong questions, as they upset people, as they change priority and they didn't even know it, right? So there's, we love it when our clients go to, uh, whether it be study tours or they go to plant tours, right? But whenever they all come back, we got to do gamble walks, okay? Uh, time out, all right? Before we randomly do management by walking around, right? We're going to stand back and understand, right? What are the objectives we're trying to accomplish with a gamble walk? The most important thing about a gamble walk for a senior leader is I think I communicated something to my organization. When I walk Gemba, I should see some semblance of what I think I said in the various areas I go. All right? So if I know that product development and new technology is our number one driver to revenue and our future, when I walk in engineering, I should expect to see some semblance on their dashboards, in their huddles, in their employee ideas, kind of aligned around increasing velocity and effectiveness and capacity in engineering. If I walk in engineering and I see nothing, hmm, right? Perhaps my message was not as clear as I thought it was, right? The other thing about, about Gemma Walks for senior leaders is Gemma Walks represent the opportunity to um, assign and apply resources that you wouldn't have known otherwise. The most powerful question that an executive can ask when walking Gemma is what can I do for you or what do you need from me? And if you can get the right kind of information and you can respond with resources, you're actually encouraging the right kind of behavior. Right. <clears throat> what else we got going on here? Uh, here's an example, right? I, I kind of went through this earlier on the ED, right? Oops, this is worth talking about real quick. Here are the key processes, 
right, that are critical to make an, to make an emergency department successful, right? If you do these really, if you do these really, really, really well, right, you have a good foundation. Here's an here's an example, right, of a dashboard with metrics that mean something to the team, right? What was interesting was. I wonder if this is on like a uh, uh, slideshow or something. So what's interesting is this: <laughs> um, is when these when when measures when measures are actually designed in a way that makes sense for the people who do the work. Um, the people that actually look at the board are the people that do the work, right? It's very 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 powerful. Watch out for one size fits all dashboards. Yeah, when I walk the shop, when I walk my hospital, I want to see the same board in every single department because it makes it easier for me. Well, guess what you just did? Made it worthless to everybody else. All right. Um, <clears throat> real quick, over here, ED volume up 22%. Left not being seen up 84%. See that revenue number? $7.1 million, right? Real, targeted real improvements, right? Make real meaningful impact, right? In, in, in things such as um, revenue. I think I do have it on the uh, slideshow thing. Um, <clears throat> Some of the hospital results, take your pick, right? Gaps in care is a big one. If you guys aren't familiar with healthcare, one of the biggest drivers to really reducing healthcare cost is to identify a gap in care and close it as quickly as possible. A gap in care is I'm a diabetic, I haven't had an A1C test in three months, right? You prescribed me meds for three months, you gave me a refill at 30 days, and I haven't filled it, and it's been four months. Identifying that gap in care, getting the care team involved to close that gap in care is how you stop me from going to the ER. Right, it is the is the single biggest driver, right, to uh, our medical expense in the future. Okay, other stuff here. That was one of the fav my favorite boards that was ever built. Right, that's actually a visual management board for a COO who ran eleven different physician practices. Obviously, green is good, red is not so good, and this was how they managed at a glance. And when we flipped over the little post-it note, they could see what kinds of things were being worked on. This was before they wanted to automate with all kinds of fancy stuff. <coughs> Another type of system, right? This is uh. Um, a picture taken, right? Actually, I think this was, uh, I can't remember. I think it was um, Lifetime Products. No, it was, it was Lifetime Products. And what they have is they have a process. This is an improvement system, right? Where you can get in a Kaizen card, right? And you can fill it out. There's a, I think that's an example of one. And you can put it into your area, graveyard, days, or swing shift, right? And then there's a process in place, right? to go on through and, f and be able to visually monitor, right, the types of ideas that were generated, the aging of the ones that, that are still there, right, and which ones have been closed, right? So again, is this magic? Does it belong everywhere? Not necessarily, but this was a pretty good one. Worked well for them, right? I've had a lot of clients take this picture and, take, and make variations to it to meet their needs. Um, <clears throat> I thought this was a neat one here. Um, this is how an area assigns work, right? So here are the different tasks. There are the different people with their pictures, right? Not done and done, right? It's a very simple way, right? Remember, systems that drive ideal behavior, right? The behavior we want is to get these tasks done every single day, right? Can we build systems that help us or guide towards, towards the right kind of behavior, right? Um, <coughs> This was a neat one here, right? Uh, this particular place, I think it was uh, at GE, where they did a lot of uh, heavy lifting with overhead cranes, right? They had different kinds of, of lifts, a routine lift, a non-routine lift, and a critical lift, right? And this was important to them for their safety program that they thought, they thought it was worth building a system for this to guide the right kind of behavior. And what it works is on a routine lift, you go here, step one, step two, step three, step four, right? A non-routine lift, step one, step two, step three, step four. Right? And then right here was a three ring binder of handwritten pictures of how to go ahead and sling this thing and rig this thing, right? depending on what's been done before. It was beautiful. Wanna know why? Because it was real. Right? So we knew it was in, we knew it was in use. Right? Um, some other just different pictures, right? Oops. This one here is kind of neat. This company here was start, you can, this, for those who don't know, this is X Matrix and Strategy Deployment up here. They were in the process of rolling this thing out, but everyone, everyone was confused, right? So here's the level one, follow the yarn to level two, follow the yarn to level three, and you can see how your measure aligns, right, to company objectives, 
right? I thought it was kind of cute, right? This here's a picture out of US Synthetic, right? They probably run the best huddles I've ever seen, right? Um, <coughs> uh, they run them every two hours, and to hear the conversations and the topics that are going, they're being discussed, they're real. How'd it go the last two hours? What do you see, right? Uh, um, do you have any ideas? What can we do to make it better? Uh, this here's an example of a, uh, a I believe, a, a Gemba walk, and an operator actually showing what's going on, and obviously some sort of board, right? So I just want to give you some pictures, right, of what these systems might look like. Um, here's some other ones as well. This one here, ooh, that's a special picture. This one right here is actually a signal. This is a, this is a system to trigger making more of those things. It's a rack. When the rack's empty, turn it in. You pick up another one, it's already done. All right, this is at the Hillram in Germany. Here's a pulse line. That's another system. It's a work system, right, where they're all on a chain going from below, tugging at a certain pace. Uh, this is not so sexy, right, but they're doing forging. It's still another work system. It's a cell that's been designed, right, and so on and so on. I thought this was neat because, oh, nuts. Uh, I'm a grandpa, right, and uh, twins were born uh, 12 weeks early. Spooky, 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 right? So um, they wound up at the University of Iowa in NICU, which is phenomenal. Um, I spent a lot of time there actually rounding with the docs and with the nurses. It was actually a lot of fun. Right, but this here is a really interesting system they had in place, right, of communication that mattered, right, mattered to the nurses, mattered to the family, right, and that's, that's my little grandson, right, and um, he's a twin, right, so that's, that's the two of them right there. Right. I had that one, or get him a, a picture with a Cubs outfit on, I wasn't going to do that. And then, um, you know, when you think about what's possible, right, in terms of improvements, right, and now remember, I, I happen to come from a land, right, where demonstrating compelling value a la bottom line improvement or bottom line uh, performance in an acceler accelerated period of time is important, right? So by taking a targeted focus approach, model line or model plant, identifying the one or two key measures we're going after and being really, really, really good at doing it, and using those models as the mechanism and methodology to demonstrate, show, practice, not just how to do it and what good looks like and how to use 5S and how to use Kanban and how to use standard work. More important, most importantly, in those model areas, you're demonstrating performance that looks and sounds 30, 40% better than whatever the baseline was. Right? Again, whether the goal was turnaround time, quality, productivity, or whatever it is. Right? Just different examples. So summary, um, <clears throat> how you achieve results is more important, right, than actually achieving the result itself, right? We're better than that, right? You're better than that, right? Decide how you want your organization to behave as they go through improving performance. Strange question, but there's a reason the Shingo Prize is so distinctive from anything else out there in the industry today, right? Principle-based architecture. Always know your business case. Right? I'll be talking to a cell leader, right? I'll, and I'll ask the question, right? what are your objectives for improvement right now? Right? What are we trying to improve? Right? And that, their answer absolutely guides and frames up how I will have the conversation with them. All right? <coughs> Identify the key processes and systems that are needed for success. When you follow this number, one, this number one and two right here, the question of what to work on becomes really, really, really straightforward. Right? <coughs> Identify the ideal behavior that you want to see in the cell. Right? That's pretty natural as well, by the way. Right? Then select, or really deselect, the systems that are key to phase one success. People think about picking the right systems. It's actually not. The problem is you're going to have five, thing, five systems you want to work on. You can't do them all. Right? So it's a process of deselection and selection right, that will help guide um, what you're doing there. Um, and I talk about phase one success. So here's something else to think about. If you have a top ten list of things that are, are, are troublesome and problematic to an area, a top 10, I guarantee you that if you have a legitimate top 10, and numbers one, two, and three are really one, two, and three, if you fix one and two, there ain't no chance number three is number one. No chance. What you're seeing is a top 10 based on the interactions that you have. When you fix the top two, three goes away. Four goes to number 12. You have no idea what's going to be number one. I guarantee you. Right? It happens all the time. We run this in every single industry. Right? So keep that in mind about, uh, about top 10. I'm almost done, Chloe. All right? And then for yourselves, 
practice building a model cell or a model value stream. And I absolutely encourage you to do one in the office for information and flow, right? And one in material flow, right? If you, if you can do that, right, you'll get some really, really good practice. Oh, so <coughs> last quote. Um, I had a Japanese consultant uh, uh, at my plant for four years, right? I got my first plant manager's job, I was 27 years old. I didn't deserve to have it, right? But here's what the deal was, right? <coughs> I was an outsider coming to Han, and I got my first plant manager job. That never happens, right? But I was offered it under these conditions. John, we're gonna, we're gonna, we want to offer you this job, but listen to the expectations. Okay. Productivity improvement, 1% per month. That's more than 12% per year. Guess what I said? Okay. <laughs> I wasn't saying no, right? Quality improvement, 50% internal defects reduction per year, 50% external defects per year. Guess what I said? Okay, all right? Lead time, current lead times are 10 to 12 weeks. We're going to two weeks. We don't know how fast, but it's coming fast. Guess what I said? Okay, all right? And by the way, we have some help for you. We have these Japanese consultants. They're gonna come in one week per month, every month. They're gonna help you make these improvements. Okay, so I got the job, all right? Well, for the first year, no joke, I was not allowed to ask any questions and I ran the plant. That's not a joke, right? Eventually, I asked Mr. Nawano, right? You know, there's Toyota, right? You get tours at Toyota all the time. The, almost the day they opened Toyota Georgetown in 1986, they started giving tours to GM, Ford, and Chrysler. And I asked the question, how is it that, that, that Toyota is so willing to give tours to the competition in their brand new factory? He goes, Kim, what they need to know, they cannot see. That's actually the takeaway from this message. Right. Understand the objectives. You can't see that. You can see the 5S. You can see the Kanban. You see the tape on the floor. If you run back and copy all that, you're likely putting in solutions to waste you don't even have. All right. So just give that some thought. Thanks, guys. Oh, questions, too, if you guys have any. Did you give me the sign? I, I, I gave you many signs. I didn't even see them. <laughs> You guys are totally lucky. I'm within four minutes of done time. <laughs> I guess I just wasn't looking that way. Um, again, I'll be at, at the running workshop 8 to noon tomorrow. I'll be around for the ice cream social as well. If you guys got questions, don't hesitate. My email is on there, John K at John Kim Consulting. Right? And again, if you guys want a bazillion case studies, there's some really good ones on the website. You can download a PDF. So thank you. As well, Eden wanted me to announce that there are a couple available slots for the workshop tomorrow if you're interested, get with Eden. And the breakfast is gonna start at seven o'clock at the ninth floor of the business building. And right after that, we're gonna have the workshop as well. Um, if you'd like to stay, we're gonna do question and answer for however long, you guys want. however long you guys wanna stay. So again, we'd like to thank John and Kim for coming out and presenting this information to us. And do fill out the surveys, guys. Oh, I should yeah. have said that at the beginning. Enjoy life. <laughs> You're just getting started. So.